Hello, everyone. On behalf of AgriLink, Feed the Future, and the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on the role of cold chain logistics in food safety of perishable food. Today, our panelists from the Business Drivers for Food Safety Project will discuss what constitutes an effective cold chain, how it affects the health and nutrition of consumers, and what can be done to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of temperature control systems in the developing world in order to improve food safety and quality and reduce loss. My name is Julie McCarty, and I am your AgriLink webinar host with the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And I will be your facilitator today, so you'll hear my voice periodically, especially during our question and answer sessions. Before we dive into the content, I would just like to go over a few of our usual items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourself, to ask questions, and to share any resources that you might have that are relevant to the discussion today. We love for our webinars to be interactive, and so the chat box is the place to do that. We will be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and our team of experts on hand today may be able to answer some of them directly in the chat box. And we'll also have a longer verbal Q&A session after the presentations are complete. One tip I would like to highlight, and I'll call this out later as well, is that if you're having any trouble seeing the detail on some of the slides, you can put the slides into full screen mode. If you hover over the slide presentation pod, you'll see four little outward pointed arrows that um, will allow you to put the slides into full screen mode and uh, also it can uh, get rid of the chat box if you find that a bit distracting temporarily. And then to bring it back to the regular view, you can hover again and select those four little arrows again. Uh, one last thing, we are recording this webinar today and we will email you the recording, the transcript, and any additional related resources once they are ready. And we encourage you to share those with your colleagues. And they'll also be posted on the AgriLinks website. Okay, I think we're ready to dive in. So I am going to introduce our first speaker and then we can get started with the content. So I would like to welcome Lourdes Martinez Romero to provide an introduction to the topic today and introduce our two main speakers. Lourdes is an agricultural economist in the Bureau for Resilience in Food Security within our relatively new food safety division. And she works on low in income consumers and micro, small and medium enterprises access to safe, nutritious food systems in local and international markets. So I'm excited to welcome my colleague, Lourdes, to give us a brief introduction. Lourdes? Thank you, Julie. Welcome, everyone, and thank you, thank you all for joining us today. Before passing the microphone to our experts, I wanted to highlight why we are here today. Over 800 million people are hungry, and this number is growing. COVID-19 added additional distress, and various projections say that around 130 million will go hungry in 2020 due to this pandemic. The negative impact of COVID-19 on hunger and malnutrition will persist for years, if not decades, after the pandemic subsides. We will need to build back, but we can't do it in the way things were prior to the pandemic. We must build back stronger. Investing in a stronger food system is key. We see improving food safety as an integral part of this effort and that, that directly impacts our critical athlete growth, resilience, and nutrition objectives. Of course, there are challenges to make our food system safer for all, but we also see tremendous opportunities as a result of, of all these transformations. We know that 60% of the food value is added after production some 20% at retail, and 40% in between. The in-between, also known as hidden middle, which comprises the processing, packaging, transport, and other off-farm activities is essential for getting safe food from farm to fork. Tens of thousands of these businesses exist today in the low-income countries in which we work. Companies like Real Food in Nigeria, Twiga in Kenya, and consumers in rural and urban areas are relying on these enterprises to access safe, nutritious food. However, there has to be a however always. Micro, small, and medium enterprises 
what we call here today growing food businesses in formal and informal markets serve millions of consumers while facing multiple food safety obstacles. They confront barriers to accessing affordable credit and finance. They lack training to implement food safety best practices. They face an enabling environment with more hurdles than incentives to successfully adopt improved food safety practices. Sometimes, just small changes among food traders and people working in markets can have a big impact on mitigating food safety risks within food systems. As the invitation for the webinar said, food hygiene and temperature control are two critical components to keep food safe as it moves through the food system. Temperature control systems are often inaccessible for many of these growing businesses, or improper food hygiene practices may not be well understood. USA has partnered with Food Enterprise Solutions to implement the Feed the Future Business Drivers for Food Safety. This program is developing cost-effective approaches through operational research that tackles growing food businesses' challenges with post-harvest food management. In addition, Business Driver for Food Safety wants to help growing food businesses find a business case for food safety so that changes can be sustained and transformative, building a better food system that serves all consumers. This webinar is just one in a series of knowledge sharing sessions to introduce existing technologies that are proven to be effective that need to be disseminated and, ac and accessed by the hidden middle. Finally, it is not just the business case that moves us to address food safety. Contamination of food by either chemicals or bacteria leads to diseases, loss of important resources, and unnecessary death. One in 10 people worldwide become ill from consuming unsafe food every year. Low middle income countries lose around 110 billion per year due to lost productivity and medical costs. Up to 70% of diarrheal diseases are caused by unsafe food and water. 420,000 people die every year due to foodborne diseases. 125,000 are children. I believe we need to keep repeating these statistics over and over so we remind ourselves why we care and must find a transformative case for food safety. We need to support food system transformation because this remains the most effective pathway out of poverty for the world's poorest. With private investment leading the way, the whole system needs to work cohesively to achieve food security decrease malnutrition, and end hunger. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and look forward to hearing from you during the discussion portion of this webinar. I now want to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Douglas Tarrant. Dr. Tarrant is a professor of public health at the Mel and Enid Zuckerman College of Public Health at the University of Arizona. His research focuses on the interaction between parasitic diseases and nutritional status and food security. Dr. Tan is also principal investigator on the business driver for food safety study of the primary food safety challenges in micronutrient-dense supply chains, which will be published in a few months as part of the technical learning series. After Mr. Tan, we'll hear from Mr. James Rusty Eason, Mr. Eason is an expert in operations of third-party logistics and cold storage facilities. He has been an investment strategist for several private equity firms and venture capitalists, as well as for the IFC, BSC, and USDA. He has conducted operational studies and investment mapping for several USA projects throughout Africa, Central Asia, and Middle East. He has trained executives and managers in proper coal supply chain management and operation of coal storage facilities. That includes all levels of food safety, knowledge, and capacity building. Mr. Eason works for the business driver for food safety as a subcontractor, Bright House Consultancy and Training, a Nairobi-based woman-owned business. This morning's presentation from Dr. Chan will discuss threats 
to retain nutrient value during food processing and packaging. Then Mr. Ethan will walk us through food safety challenges in cold chain logistics. Now let's get started and over to you, Dr. Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Julie and Lourdes. Um, I want to thank everyone at uh, Food Enterprise Solutions for asking me to present today. And I give my gratitude to everyone who is working at USAID on the Seed the Future program, as this work is incredibly important to help meet many of the sustainable development goals. I also want to acknowledge the support I got from Yavinia Varivoda, who helped with providing me numerous documents as background information. I'm also pleased to be here with Rusty, as his presentation will provide information on how to operationalize processes that maintain the nutritional value of food. I plan to present an overview for what I think are some salient issues when it comes to food processing, the cold chain, and how these steps fit into food systems in order to provide not only a safe food supply, but also a nutritional food supply that can be supported by small businesses in low and middle income countries. This overview is not comprehensive, but I do hope that it stimulates conversations when we get to answers and questions at the end of our presentation. I do want to remind everyone that what is being presented today is just a portion of what is involved in a food system. There are many aspects of a food system that can affect the nutritional quality of food. This includes not only the areas of science and technology, the processing itself, but also is dependent on policies, how markets function, and nutritional quality is also influenced by social organizations and the biophysical environment. The majority of my presentation is going to be on the science and technology. I know that this slide is busy, but I do believe that it's extremely important as it illustrates how the food system and value chains interact to influence both domestic and international markets and ultimately influence not only diet, but also as illustrated on the right side, poverty, food security, and malnutrition, which are the social outcomes for which we all want to improve. This is from the work of Linda Valjusten working with the Slingerlands group in the Netherlands on agriculture and nutrition. And it aligns well with the Reardon, what Reardon labeled in 2015 as the hidden middle, the parts in orange. This midstream portion of the food system is highly relevant to consider in addition to agricultural production in terms of achieving the second sustainable development goal to reduce poverty. Specifically, the hidden middle is responsible for 30 to 40% of the added value of food in the value chain in low and middle income countries. As I start presenting about food processing, I want to take a few minutes and talk about light and its effect on food. It is something that deserves more attention than it sometimes gets. Light is everywhere. It can have a tremendous effect on the organoleptic and chemical content of food and nutrients. It also needs to be considered when food is being transported. In the right situations, when those little photons from light come into contact with oils, they can lead to chemical reactions that result in the presence of 1,4-dioxin, benzene, toluene, and lipid peroxide, which are toxic. And the peroxides are the leading cause for having oils go rancid. Lipid peroxides are also highly toxic compounds that diffuse into the cell, and the nutrients are used to reduce them with enzymes such as catalase, peroxidase, and glutathione, thus making many nutrients less available to consumers and the, and the public. Additionally, peroxides may lead to diseases such as colitis, impaired immune systems, such as systemic lupus erythematosus, and vascular damage that can exacerbate liver disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cataract, and retinopathy. The bioavailability of the nutrients on this slide are affected by light, specifically UV light. Many of these are probably known to you, 
as oils or fatty acids, and that's why oils are kept in dark containers. Light is also the reason that milk bottles have basically been replaced by opaque containers preserved to preserve the vitamin A, vitamin D, and riboflavin that it contains. I want to bring your attention to the flavonoids, as they are important antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds in food. They also provide color to our food. The flavonoids are yellow, red, blue, and purple. Anthocyanins are blue, red, and purple. And quercetin is yellow and present in many herbs, fruit, and onions. When light decreases the availability of these compounds, it not only decreases the food's nutritional value, but also the color of the food. And please remember this, as it's a theme that I will be bringing up later. Now I'm going to move to a study um, that was done um, on light uh, out of Turkey. These researchers wanted to compare the effect of pasteurization and the use of UV light as methods for processing milk for both safety and shelf life. At the same time, they studied the effect of these two processes on the vitamin content in both cow's milk and goat's milk. They focus on vitamin A, vitamin B2, riboflavin, vitamin C, and vitamin E, which are all heat and light sensitive. They were careful about how they handled the milk samples after collection and kept them in a thermal bag with an ice pack at 10 degrees centigrade and immediately analyzed the milk samples. What they reported is that the nutrient content in the milk continually decreased with greater UV exposure compared with pasteurization. And with each additional exposure to UV radiation, the nutrient content decreased even more. Vitamin C was affected the most, followed by vitamin E, and then vitamin A, and then vitamin B2 or riboflavin. Based on their work, it is clear that one should not use UV light for treating milk if you want to maintain the, its nutritional value. Additionally, similar results have been reported with fluorescent light, where milk is stored in glass over a several day period as may happen in a store. Now I'm going to pivot and talk about the heat as the foundation for why cold chains are so important. Of course, you all know that there are optimal temperatures for food, and this depends on the specific product. This table is just a reminder that deep frozen food needs to have temperatures way below zero degrees centigrade. Even chilled food should be kept near zero. And then there are some perishable foods that can be stored at higher temperatures, such as melons and some of the fruit. I now want to show you the results from a study by Tuati and colleagues on the effect of storage time and temperature on the quality of fruit nectars. This is an example of how food quality for the consumer and nutritional content are related. What these researchers did is expose the nectars of oranges, the left graph, pear, the middle graph, and grapes, the right graph, to different temperatures for a 30-day period. What they showed was that increasing the temperature led to significantly more drowning of the nectars, and thus decreasing its quality for consumers. It also showed that it was much worse at 37 degrees centigrade compared with 25 degrees centigrade. And the difference between 5 degree and 25 degrees centigrade was not as great. At the same time, these researchers measured the nutrient content for phenols, number of those things that make, have different colors in the nectars, from oranges, pears, and grapes. They looked at ascorbic acid in oranges and pear, carotenoids in oranges, and total anthocyanins in the grape nectars. They showed that the phenol content of pears decreased, that's graph B, and that there were large decreases in the content of these foods regarding vitamin C, carotenoids, and for anthocyanins with increasing temperature and time. This is a good example for the importance of maintaining temperature below 25 degrees centigrade and better toward 5 degrees centigrade to maintain the nutritional value of food and the quality of the food for the consumer.
Now I'm going to turn to somewhat the opposite end of the spectrum and talk about how heat can be used to make nutritious food more available over a longer period of time by addressing drying as a food processing method for preserving the lifespan of a food product. The first thing I want to say is that drying can help inactivate microorganisms that can lead to infections and some of the microorganisms that can devalue food products. It's also important it, it's also important to take into account that even after drying a food to maintain their flavor, appearance, and nutritional value, it is best if they are kept at low temperatures and with low humidity. There is also a problem with conventional methods of drying outdoors. In addition to the issue about exposure to light, which I already spoke about, long exposures to heat can lead to decreasing the nutritional value of food, as with the example that I provided with fruit nectars. And it's important to note that there are safety risks with drying, and it can decrease the quality of food if not done correctly. As I noted before, studies have shown that vitamin content, I'm just off a bit, sorry everyone, As I noted before, studies have shown that the vitamin content of food is decreased with increasing exposures to heat and air. However, there are ways to reduce the loss of nutrients in food, uh, including sulfites and blanching is, is another example. Blanching can help reduce but not eliminate the loss of some nutrients like vitamin B1, vitamin A, and vitamin C. However, water-soluble substances can be lost due to the blanching in water. However, I do want to state that dried foods on a weight basis are often more nutrient dense in energy and micronutrients compared with their fresh state. This can be a very valuable way to have nutritious food available year round for individuals, specifically children who are at high risk for undernutrition. Now I want to talk about um, the other aspect of drying that can uh, actually increase the value of food. Uh, the recent publication in Food Reviews International showed that the price of raw fish before drying in India was about 31 rupees per kilogram. And by the time it got to a spot market after drying, it was worth 295 rupees per kilogram, almost 10 times greater. And the price at a full market was slightly greater at 374 rupees per kilogram. And the price increased to a whopping 1,480 rupees per kilogram for an online market, which is almost 50 times greater than the raw product. Now, the last example I wanted to provide is about the importance of temperature on eggs. Currently, there is a resurgence of interest in the field of nutrition about how eggs can help the growth and nutritional status of children. Eggs have a good nutritional content in terms of protein and other micronutrients. However, overall, eggs do not lose much of their nutritional value if stored properly. What is interesting is that the quality of the eggs, and that's usually measured by the height of the yolk, deteriorates faster than the nutrients during storage. Eggs can also be dried, but this also has to be done carefully to make as too much heat will lead to the Maillard reaction that decreases the bioavailability of the egg protein. I want to tell you about a study conducted by Iki and colleagues at the University of Agriculture in Makurdi, Nigeria. They measured the quality of eggs under three different conditions. They had eggs kept at ambient temperature, which could have been greater than 27 degrees centigrade in Nigeria, refrigerated eggs, and eggs that have their shells lined with a thin coat of vegetable oil. You can see how quickly the egg quality decreases measured by the Hoff unit. That's a measure of the yolk height compared to the diameter of the white when being stored at ambient temperature. But just by putting a thin coat of vegetable oil on the shell and the quality eggs stay almost the same as refrigerated eggs. 
what is also of interest is that there was less microbial growth in the eggs when the quality was also maintained. For this table, you can see that the total plate count for bacteria, the top three rows of data, and the yeast and mold count, the bottom three rows of data, were the same for the three groups at the start of the study. What is of interest is that the total plate count for bacteria significantly increased by a power of 10 after two weeks for the refrigerated eggs and by 10 to the second power in ambient temperature, but stayed relatively unchanged for the oil-coated eggs. This was also true for the yeast and mold counts. Although these counts did continue to increase over four weeks, the oil-coated eggs continued to have less microorganisms than the other two groups. I do want to conclude with what I think are the two important take-home messages. First, food processing has mixed effects on the nutritional value of food. It depends on the type of processing, the food component, like the nutrients, and the food product itself. And second, product quality, those organolectic properties, the, the microbiological aspects of, of food, and nutritional status are intimately associated with each other during food processing. And with that, I thank you and for listening. And I am able to turn this over to Rusty, uh, who will start his presentation. Thank you, Doug. I think Good we afternoon, are everyone. going to um, pull up a few Good oh, afternoon, oh, questions. Um, hi, Rusty. Uh, we were hoping to just pull up a few poll questions before we got into your part of the presentation um, for our participants to weigh in on. Uh, in response to Doug's presentation. Uh, so we'll just sit here for two minutes um, so that you can let us know how important you think uh, our retailers are concerned about having their products keep their nutritional value during storage. Um, what do you believe that egg producers consider to be the most important variable to consider? We'll broadcast these results. And also, which food processing method you believe can be implemented or modified the easiest in low- and middle-income countries? So it's always interesting to see our audience's perspectives on these questions. And our uh, presenting team will take this into account. Interesting. Thank you all for weighing in. It's interesting to see that um, it seems that about 50% of people believe that drying is the uh, perhaps the lowest lift method um, in lower and middle income countries to preserve the nutritional value of food products. Great. All right, I think we can go ahead and move along to Rusty's portion of the presentation. Thank you all for weighing in on these questions. And please do continue to post your questions for the presenters in the chat box. We will um, ask as many as we can after Rusty's presentation. So Rusty, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here. I want to thank uh, FES for bringing me on board, uh, as well as USAID. Uh, it's an honor to be here. So my topic is food safety in the cold chain. Um, we want to uh, define uh, the cold chain and how food safety meet. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, uh, the global estimates of foodborne diseases find children under five account for most of the deaths in the world. And this is due to poor handling and storage techniques uh, and multiple other facets. I got a real live picture of the cold chain in parts of Africa. Uh, this needs to be um, solved. I want to define the cold chain. It is a temperature controlled supply chain from farm to um, fork. We need to make sure that we keep it, get it as cold as possible within the first four hours of har after harvest to the optimal temperature. Some of these methods include shading on the farm. And if, as you can see, I have an example of shading there in Egypt. 
uh, collection center along with shading. Um, plastic air crates for air circulation, as well as uh, determining the handling of the product. Um, you can only fill up so much, and that way they don't overhandle it because bruising and tears and things of that nature. So returnable plastic crates are very important. Pre-cooling on farm. Again, I, as I said, uh, the first four hours is critical to extending the shelf life, some product up to 21 to 30 days. Uh, in long-term storage, blast freezing is necessary, uh, especially in the meat, protein, and sea, seafood. Um, this is quick freeze technology that brings the temperature to minus 18 Celsius within 24 to 36 hours, depending on the, the amount of product you need to run through the system. After blast freezing or chilling, you have to have cold storage to, to have an unbroken cold chain. Uh, it's better to not start the cold chain and break it anywhere along the line. And then, of course, refrigerated vehicles are very well important because at least every supply chain, you're going to have the product in the transport of vehicle three to four times before it, it hits the end user. And this is the most expensive link in the supply chain as well. So it's critical to have transfer, refrigerated transport. Now I want to just discuss briefly from a private sector third-party logistic cold chain expert. Um, the culture of your company has to, um, doesn't have to, but needs to uh, engage in planning and monitoring food safety management systems. It has to be a foundational um, core competency or value that the company finds if you're going to be a, a, a proper cold storage. Um, so you want to create a culture in your company where food safety as well as safety and, and food defense is, is, is as important as the bottom line. Compliance to regulatory agency, this is the base for any food safety management system. It is not the end all to be all. It needs to uh, sometimes be um, towards international markets rather than just domestic regulations. Third element. Here are the four key elements, is traceability. This is critical, mm -hmm. not only uh, from the production or the harvest of food, um, it has to be traceable throughout the supply chain. Some companies use blockchain to capture temperature, data, pricing, all the way through the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Traceability has to happen as well as the data has to be defended and how are you going about keeping your data correctly. So it boils down to every aspect of the, um, the commodity. Again, as I said, the food safety management system has to be the foundational stone of an organization that is feeding the world. Your documents need to be uh, in, in accuracy and, and, and in place. Employee training has to happen quarterly. It needs to be a weekly, daily type of situation. Internal audits, not just waiting on third-party audits, but your management, senior management has to issue audits around their uh, particular food safety management system. And then reporting and effective action as well. And recently, over the last few years, uh, threat assessments, critical control points, and vulnerability assessments have become vital to success. Um, food defense, uh, so you have no one that can adul adulterate your product. Um, in developing market, uh, unlike the US and maybe Europe, um, security uh, around these types of uh, warehouses or transport vehicle is critical and somewhat 20,000 US dollars a month in cost and just to defend depending on the size of the the uh, company. Vulnerability helps mitigate the threats. So these are important aspects to pay attention to um, when you're setting up your um, food safety management system. The critical areas for contamination. For me, I, I don't want to overstate one section of the supply chain over another. I think it's all critical. It's a one seamless uh, responsibility of each stakeholder. I developed, we use this slide here to show that from farm to sea, 
far, from farm or sea to fork, uh, whether you're in agriculture production or whether you're the consumer, uh, you have a, there's a responsibility for each stakeholder along the supply chain to maintain proper handling and storage and hygiene to, to maintain the quality and the temperature of that food. Now there's um, companies um, are looking at the consumer. How are they taking it from the retailer? Are they are they going directly home? There are studies that's taking around that area to make sure that their product gets to the table and it's it's, it's intended quality. So we want to deal with the business reason for food safety, not just from a profitable standpoint. Uh, safe and quality food is, is, extends the life of a human. Reduces foodborne illnesses. Economically, this economically burdens many countries. This is vital to uh, food safety. Market access. Some markets are just not accessible um, with um, non-certified food, let's say it that way. Um, it needs to be um, certified, it needs to be monitored, it needs to be controlled. Um, and so uh, certification allows you to market access that typically you're just would be domestic or local. It also gives you brand advantage over local comp competitors. People look for these uh, symbols such as British Retail Consortium or ISO. These are uh, in the food industry. Everyone wants to see who you are adhering to, which regulations, depending on your uh, link in the value chain. So I want to speak about a few cold chain solutions. This is not an exhaustive list by no means, uh, but these are some things and, and some small solutions, some larger solutions that can be put on the farm or in a dry warehouse to operate cold chain uh, in different methods. Um, so mobile pre-cooler and mobile blast freezer. And there are some technologies out of Turkey and, and India that um, brings the product to four degrees or to the right temperature in four hours. Mobile blast freezers, these are important. Uh, for example, here in Kenya during the COVID crisis when it first started, um, processors were shut down, social distancing took place, uh, farmers had nowhere to go with the poultry. Um, they turned them over to me. I gave them a, a short-term solution. I could not store it. I operate a, a 5,000 metric ton facility here, and uh, we could not store it because we could not remove the heat fast enough. So I gave them some dry ice, wrapped it in some paper. We dipped and then stored it, dipped it in the dry ice, and then froze it, and then brought it into storage. But there was roughly about 150,000 birds that was lost during COVID because there is no mobile, no blast freezing within East Africa, except for the upscale processors. And so um, Adelano Solar Cold Storage also has a water maker on it. So it, it cap captures and filters the evaporation water off of the cylinders of the cold storage and creates 80 liters a day. This is a, um, can be a freezer but it will not remove the heat fast enough to store it. It just maintains temperature. Other technologies such as CloudTrack is temperature monitoring and fleet management software, which goes along with GPS tracking of the reefer trucks. This is critical when you're looking at food defense. Um, sometimes uh, you'll have um, people who hijack trucks depending on the value. In East Africa, sugar is also a very high value commodity and you have to be very careful how you um, handle it. Um, one technology in, in the US I found very um, unique is Verizon Connect. It's a geofence. So if you've ever been in the warehouse industry, truck drivers will tell you they're at your warehouse, but they're not. This allows you to know exactly when they back up to a longitude latitude and alerts the supplier, both on both ends the, and the product is monitored from point A to point Z throughout the whole supply chain and wherever he goes. And this is one of the most advanced uh, GPS monitoring and tracking devices there is. There are other technologies um, like the German engine uh, that can, and then Viking has a thermal uh, to reduce energy loss, uh, reduce energy use. There's other operational techniques that can also reduce energy use. 
Uh, so that, this is my uh, presentation from a uh, third-party logistics and co-chain expert. I thank you for taking the time with me today. Appreciate you very much. Thank you so much, Rusty and Doug. And now we have some time for questions. So thank you to everyone who has posted questions in the chat box. We've been collecting them on the side. And we will get through as many of them as we can. Okay, all right, so I am going to go ahead and start with the very first question that came in from Margaret Ziegler, uh, which is uh, kind of a big question, and we thought um, perhaps, Rusty, you could start by answering this question, but Doug, you're welcome to weigh in as well. And Margaret said, I would love to know if investors in the private sector or public sector are looking at innovative technologies in developing countries to use local materials for sustainable food packaging that protect, protects nutrients and shelf life. So a question about kind of local procurement, local materials for these efforts. So this is for me. Yeah, I'm yes, honestly, at this point, I'm, they, yeah, okay. They, uh, there's a delay in my phone connection, sorry. Yes, there are some investors that, that look at these types of things. Um, just depends uh, on what the need is. But there are people that, you know, there are companies here that use banana leaves and and uh, bamboo and all these different things that cover, you know, and, and for example, Twiga Food does it here in Kenya. So, and that's invested by multiple investors. I don't know if I want to get into the list of them, but IFC is involved. Quite a few. So, yes. I'd like to add to that, Rusty, that I, I don't know I, about the investors, but I do know that there are some interesting new technologies that are being looked at, especially around using uh, what might be considered a more green type of products, such as cellulose uh, or using uh, seaweed to help make. Um, packaging materials. I'm not sure how they are for preventing light or helping with temperature, but they are those are resources that are, would be available locally if manufacturers invest in um, within their low and middle income countries on these um, technologies. Um, clearly seaweed is, um, people have a coast and cellulose is from plants and um, and this would be an alternative to petrochemical uh, packaging um, technology. Great. Thank you, Doug and Rusty. Um, all right, Doug, a question that came in um, in the middle of your presentation about your fish drying example. Deirdre Holcroft asked, did the fish drying example take into account weight loss during drying? Well, the, the first chain in, in that is the cost of the fish to maybe the first spot market. Clearly, the, the wet weight is um, greater than the dry weight. And that has to do with even the nutrient density of food um, after drying. But I think what's important about um, the example I provided is that the cost of the dried fish increased even from the spot market to the full-time market to the online market. And in that case, the dried weight was always the same, and the cost of the same dry weight went up as it went through this um, value chain. But clear, you're right that the wet weight and the dry weight are, are definitely different. So when you have 100 grams of something that's dry, that may have started off at two or 300 grams as wet weight. So you do need to take that into account. But I don't think it's a 10 times difference. I think that was the biggest issue, I, the, the, the concept I saw, is that the value went up 10 times, and I don't think the dry weight is 10 times less than the wet weight. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Doug. And um, let's see, another question that came in um, during your presentation, 
to quickly ask from Nalaliban uh, Wujangi is what is the acceptable level for YMC, which is yeast and mold count, in food products? I can't give you the exact um, count number of that. Um, so all I can say is that the, those numbers went up. I think looking at um, a specific um, reference standard would be good. And I, I could get that to you and put that into the notes um, after the conference. I don't have the exact count at this point for you. That sounds good. We can share in the post-event resources uh, a few more um, resources in that regard. Um, all right, I'll move on to a question that came in for Rusty, or a couple of questions for Rusty. Let's see, from Sudeep uh, Jaracharya, is it necessary to conduct pre-cooling at the farm for vegetables and fruits, for example, carrot and lemon, or can it happen in a pack house prior to cold storage? Yes, short answer is yes. Um, it can happen in a pack house. Uh, typically, you don't want to be no, not that far away from the field that it is harvested in, but uh, I have dealt with um, di different suppliers uh, all over the world, and some of them do have pre cooling in the pack house, uh, especially Egypt and the US. Um, but they need to get it into the shade and, and, and keep it cool as, as quick as possible before they get there. And then harvest times is also critical. If you can, you harvest in the morning or, you know, when it's cooler outside. But yes. Great, thank you. Uh, another a somewhat specific question for you, or a, a two-part question from John Porterfield. Is maintaining a temperature below four degrees Celsius of value for types, certain types of products and what types? And then also asking if a cold chain is broken but the products are made below 4C, can pro uh, the product be safely refrozen and is this mentioned in any standard? So a, a couple of questions about that, that level of 4C and how important it is. Uh, so Pharmaceutical, for example, is between two to eight, two to eight degrees. So they typically set it between four and five. It just depends on the commodity and, and the requirements of the storage. Fresh fruits and vegetables, same thing. Uh, just it, it's optimal temperature. There's commodity storage man, manuals that's provided by several colleges as well as GCCA, Global Cold Chain Alliance, that will identify which one should be at which temperature. Um, the the other question was, again, repeat the second part. Sure. It was about if a cold chain is broken but the products are maintained below 4 degrees, can it be safely refrozen? A refrozen is not um, a, a um, good process. I mean, yes, you can, but you're going to allow the bacteria and, and the, to start growing back and then freeze the extra bacteria. And what you're doing is you're going to do do away with the taste and the whole quality of that product. Um, you just don't want to do that. So if you start a cold chain, you need to continue it. Uh, and so if you don't, then sometimes if you can get it to the retailer quickly quickly enough, then that's what happens. And I'm speaking from a developing market standpoint, not a a developed market. So sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. All right. Mm -hmm. So it's best not to refreeze, though, if it's already been frozen. Great, thank you. Another question for you, Rusty, and um, Lloyd LePage posed this question broadly to the audience as well, and so we're certainly always interested um, in our participants helping answer each other's questions or uh, add to this discussion. But Lloyd asks, um, what three or what top three policy changes can African governments make to release rapid scale up of cold chain and dehydration in their countries? And uh, Rusty, we thought you could kick off this answer. Wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, what three policy change? 
Um, first, the importance on food safety. Um, so various countries I've been in, they don't have standards or food safety standards written. Uh, for example, some, some countries are implementing uh, right now uh, national food safety alliances, associations, and, and then they need to be budgeted, funded, and enforced. Um, so in a lot of African countries, standards are not written. Uh, Kenya, East African community has some, but there are that, uh, others that do not. Um, we, I worked on some of them in Benin uh, and in West Africa quite a bit. Um, that's, that's the thing. That, and also, you know, uh, they need to deal with the Codex Alimentarius and understand that it has to be written based upon the culture and the, these kind of things. So the standards are missing in a lot of these countries. Great, thank you so much, Rusty. All right. Another important question um, that was targeted towards you, Rusty, came in from Ashagri Wolde Jorgis, who said that USAID has installed several chillers in milk collection centers in Ethiopia, but most are not functional due to electric inaccessibility and cost. Can you comment on how cold chain can be implementable in developing countries, even if a cold chain contributes um, a lot to ensure food of animal sorts like milk and meat? So, uh, and then another question came in from Jamisian Mabula, who said that most African countries are facing the challenge of energy. Electricity is not available all the time to all people, is there any way to help this so that most developing countries can adopt food quality and shelf life? So on the whole, you know, a question about energy accessibility in developing countries um, being inaccessible or costing too much and how that affects cold chain accessibility. Right, um, and cold chain is a, is a heavy energy user, typically, depending on how you uh, design it. Um, but there are some t there are different companies that's looking at the milk value chain. Um, one of the issues there, though, is in, during the collect the collection process or the collection center, um, um, a lot of the companies don't have uh, infrastructure in place to handle that part correctly. Even though at the at the the smallholder farmers are catching say ten to fourteen liters a day they carry it to a collection center, there's no traceability uh, for each individual farmer. So that's a food safety issue that happens in all of East Africa and Ethiopia as well. There are some solar milk chillers that's out there. Um, Adelano has one, D-Grid Energy has one. Uh, there's a company out of Germany called Redavia that's looking at all of Africa to help implement solar power. Um, Wind power is another option for these types of things. There has to be investment. So some of that, um, we go back to policy here a little bit. Uh, if you're going to con contract farming or if you're going to work with smallholder farmers, then the, the buyers or the supply chain managers have to invest in them as well. Um, so there's there has to be a, a understanding that if you're an off taker or a buyer of this product, that you need to invest into the types of uh, technologies that make the product uh, more safer. Absolutely. Thank you, Rusty. All right. Another question came in from Mira Chandra. What are the costs associated with these technologies? And um, Rusty, I think she was referring to the list of cold ch chain technologies that you had on a slide. Is it reasonable that medium and small or uh, small and medium enterprises in see the future target countries can afford them? That's the pre preconceived I can, ideal, to be honest with you. But I, I've lived in Africa for 10 years, uh, and I've been to two, probably seven to 10 countries in the last five years. And um, uh, money has not always been the issue. It's been more about sometimes understanding or do they want to part with that money. 
Um, so there are cheaper solutions. I mean, you can get from ten thousand dollars to, you know, to small scale co solar coal source from ten thousand dollars to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Blast freezers are going to be anywhere between thirty thousand to a hundred thousand um, dollars. I but what I want you to what I can say this. I mean, um, people may uh, they they that big size warehouses blast freezers or, you know are these issues are with them, but feeding into an already uh, sizable infrastructure because these costs come down and the energy uses come down, the more product you can pass through it, So, which is throughput. So if I can move 100 million pounds in one facility, is, that's better than doing 100 million pounds through 300,000 of these things. So just from an uh, environmental standpoint, so it, there needs to be operational efficiencies and balance. So they're they're considered expensive, but it depends on your production and your volume. And then because you're in the industry, in the food industry, logistics should cost about 25 cents a kilogram. Okay, just to be honest, all mm -hmm. the way through the supply chain. All right, I work with uh, one of the largest companies in East Africa currently that does this all day long, and I've done it in the U.S. as well. So the the margins are basically the same. It's just where the money goes to. Thanks, Rusty. And I'd also like to highlight that uh, Russ Webster pointed out in the chat box that finding cost-effective ways to implement technologies and practices that make a return on investment worthwhile for small and medium-sized food businesses as a key objective for the business drivers for food safety project, which is being highlighted today. And this is the, uh, the Food Enterprise Solutions mission. So um, definitely there will be more coming forth from the business drivers for food safety project. All right, let's see. Another good question from uh, Catherine Peary. Uh, and also, Catherine, thank you for um, sharing some resources and links on training in the chat box. Catherine asks, if any research or analysis has been carried out on what scale of operations an SME should have to be able to afford these types of equipment. So linking affordability with an ideal scale or size of operations. You want me to answer that one? Uh, sure, that would be great. Yeah, so I won't say no professional uh, study that I know of, but my, um, I mean, I do this all the time. I, literally, I'm working on an ROI um, project right now for another country, uh, Georgia, um, that actually brings the blast freezing technology to a smallholder farmer. And so I'm taking the, you know, the retail sector or the QSRs and, and restaurants have these blast chillers, blast freezers, um, and you can use that on a small scale operation as a um, 40 kilograms every four hours to minus 18 Celsius, and uh, this product costs 30,000 or 3,000 US dollars. It operates at about $30 a day, and that's with four employees operating it. Um, it's it's a very high end stainless steel, very good equipment um, that can you can use it as cold chain as a service. Um, so then, but the cost per kilogram runs about seventy five cent on that machine. But the one I showed on my presentation from Turkey is a twenty five ton unit, which is basically a forty foot container retrofitted into a pre cooler and blast freezer. It costs two cent a kilogram. All right. So the volumes that you want to, you want to, where you want to get to is about 25 tons, where that's basically a truckload. All right. So that's where the price of blast freezing uh, comes down, pre-cooling comes down, uh, and so the, as I said earlier, the volumes are are key, and that's basically for small-scale farmers is between uh, 22 to 25 tons to make it cost effective and you can still hit the target market even if it's on the domestic side. Because at two cents a cost per kilogram, uh, that's what that's a sweet spot to be honest with you. Thanks, 
Thank you, Rusty. All right, we've got a few more questions that we're able to squeeze in. Let's see. Um, all right, so to Rusty, a question from Hori Chiquez. What do you think of charcoal or sand evaporative cooling systems as an alternative to solar cooling systems? Oh, zero, zero energy cooling chamber. Um, it works. It, it lowers probably two to four degrees, if I remember correctly. Um, it's a it's a solution that works um, about that temperature range. Field heat is not going to be removed. It will extend the shelf life. It's not going to get it to um, the right temperature, if you will, for that product. But it is better than nothing, let's say that way. And it will extend a few days. Very interesting. Thank you. All right. A question has come in from Margaret Ziegler. Are there best practices or effective examples of technical assistance, especially for business skills, like negotiating contracts, tracking inventories, implementing food safety protocol protocols, that the sponsoring organizations here can share with us? How can we get to scale with business skills and SME development? And uh, Rusty or Doug, whichever of you would like to weigh in on this, that would be great. I can weigh in on it if we need to. Um, I've done business development diagnostics. Well, okay. I've done go on business diagnostics in several countries on companies. Um, they just need access to the um, material, the training, and the capacity, and all that um, uh, is is available. I currently live in Kenya. And as you see, Bright House Consultancy is, a, is an organization we work with. Uh, I've done these diagnoses in Nigeria with uh, Roberta. Um, so it's, it's um, something that needs to happen. Uh, it's negotiating contracts. I do it every day for small-scale businesses here. Uh, I, um, so yes, it's, 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 it needs to be done because it's missing, because they need to understand what the buyers are looking at why food safety is important, what does it do for them, how do they get into the market, uh, how do they compete on a contractual level. And so there's been a lot of um, uh, middleman uh, beating up over the years of the, these guys that come along in the middle, but it's because they know how to negotiate contracts. It's because they understand um, the market a little bit better. Maybe not to the level of what they should, but they they have a little bit better skill set of handling that negotiation. And so that's where the farmer, if we're going to go from uh, farmer to plate quicker, they have to get um, trained in that type of uh, uh, circumstance. And uh, Dr. Oh, yeah, go ahead. What I wanted to add to this, Rusty, is that is as what I wanted to add is that you know clearly you have to know the field, right? You have to know about you know the cold chain, what you're negotiating with. So you have to have the, the content, but you also have to have the communication skills. And the communication skills on how they negotiate are incredibly important and the strategies that you use. Um, I direct a training center, and I'll put down the website in the chat, uh, the Western Region Public Health Training Center. And we have lots of no-cost, short modules on communication and negotiation, not specifically to this field, but in general what those skills are needed to, and what one needs to have. And so I, I will give you that as an example. And I'm sure there are also a lot of other online resources on negotiation and communication. There's really the communication to make sure you can um, get to, as you know, the, the, the famous book on how to get to yes 
is, is that's what you want to do within those negotiations. But you have to know what your bottom line is and you know where you what you need to get out of a out of a contract. Thank you so much, Rusty and Doug. And thank you for sharing those resources in the chat box. Okay, we have just a few more questions to get through. One is from Virginia Sopila. How do you incentivize adoption of food safety and cold chain practices in the absence of regulatory enforcement? How do business drivers differ for export-oriented companies versus companies focused on the domestic market in Feed the Future countries? And I'll, I'll toss that out to Doug or Rusty, whoever would like to weigh in. I, I can do it, I guess. Um, again, the um, food, uh, the, depending on your buyer, I can give you an example in Egypt, for example. <clears throat> again, I just told you they begin to do a uh, national food safety authority. Uh, here recently over the last two, three years. Um, but there's an organization there, an export uh, an exporter association that has created their own um, brand, if you will, called HEA. And they have their own uh, a quality standard they set from the private sector side. And they're, they've set up this association, they've set up their, their, their standards. And then they, in the 19, late 80s, I believe it was, uh, I believe USAID helped them with this, um, and then they have reached markets outside of Egypt because their standards match the international standards. Uh, so grapes, you know, pomegranates all go out under HEA until recently the National Food Safety Authority has come along and um, started implementing it. Uh, and so that's, it, it has to be market-driven, buyer-driven. And, um, and then the required cold chain is, would, would come along with that because there's right now there's nothing that's more extending the shelf life better than cold chain, but lowering the temperature than anything else. Um, so this is how again it's got to be consumer demand and market driven. Great, thank you. And I can see that Russ Webster just posted a question to the audience. He is requesting that you please send in examples of your experience or approaches or best practices, lessons learned, et cetera, in building capacities among post-harvest supply chain actors, uh, seeking to expand the community of practitioners in that area. So uh, you'll see Russ's email address um, in the chat box. So please do reach out to him if you have uh, lessons learned in that regard. And uh, we have seen a lot of great resources and links come in through the chat box. So we encourage all of you to be on the lookout for the post-event email for this webinar where we will send you the recording, the transcript, uh, the chat box, Q&A and answers, um, and uh, any additional resources that we would recommend. Right. I am checking to see if we have a couple last questions that we can uh, squeeze in before we wrap up today. And I uh, will toss one out uh, from Bonnie McClafferty, uh, who said for both Doug and Rusty, or whomever would like to answer, I assume that these technologies are not all the same in terms of avoiding food safety hazard and risk. So. In the list of cold chain technologies that you provided, some may be better for uh, avoiding food safety hazards than others. Do you know of a source that places a food safety lens on technologies or innovative processes? Perhaps, Rusty, you could take that one. Take the last part of that question again. Sure. Uh, asking whether you are aware of any sort of source that places a food safety lens on technologies or innovative practices or a way that um, a user might be able to tell if a particular uh, cold chain technology is better than another in terms of food safety effects? 
and that has to do with um, uh, design build technologies could be uh, intended uses. Um, for example, the technology out of uh, um, Turkey is a container, a modified container as well as Adelano turned into a blast freezer or into a pre-cooler or into a cold storage water maker. Um, so you, you're going to have to figure out um, from a food safety, from your food safety management system that you've implemented through a company, how do you factor or design build that into your processes. So when you get into the larger scale equipment, it's based upon your design workflow of your food manufacturing. So this goes back to the, your business development needs and your capacity training and technology adoption. You need to bring people in to show food processors at a small scale that this is what needs to happen. We, you know, we start here with uh, receiving, we start here with cooking process or processing or slaughtering, whatever it is, start here and then we do this. And this is how we maintain hygiene through the whole food processing system into the either blast or chiller in or it and then into refrigerated transport. So there has to be a uh, design build type of uh, system for the corporation's uh, infrastructure. So I hope that makes sense. Yes, yeah, thank you, Rusty. All right, we've pulled up the poll questions that we asked you all to answer a little bit earlier. And uh, Doug, we were hoping that you might want to take a look at these and comment. Uh, anything you find interesting from the audience responses? Well, I, I did because one of the things I, I sort of thought about was how how high would the nutrition content of food be within the importance and you see it's pretty much split i mean nutrition itself from a processing perspective is about half and half being important somewhat you know maybe somewhat important to me is maybe less important than important um, but what i think is important about all of this using that word too often is that um, it's the link between food quality and nutrition so even if one goes to manufacturers and give an emphasis on food quality, on preventing bacteriological you know, contamination, or preventing um, the discoloration of food, if you focus on that, you will still be preserving the nutrition content of food. And I think that's you know, one, one important aspect of how you can bring these two pieces together. Um, and the other thing that I think is surprising to me is um, the answer about what you would you want to upscale first. And drying got more than half of the responses. And um, I know this is a, a, a webinar on the cold chain. And so um, I, I think some of the issues about you know, that were raised about cost, which I think Rusty uh, responded to really well that it's not the cost that often is the um, primary, you know, uh, prevention uh, uh, barrier to to cold chain. That there are other issues, but drying is something if done correctly in different types of facilities um, is a way potentially to um, preserve food and, and keep it available for people. It can be done locally. I mean, I'm, I'm not the food technologist, I'm the nutritionist on this team, and but it's clear that um, just having food available, and even if it does lose a portion of its nutrition content, there's still the food is there. So you might be losing 5, 10, 20 percent of the nutritional value, but then you still are maintaining 80 percent of that nutritional value that can be used to um, feed um, people, uh, and this can be done at the local level. I, I did see a question earlier about technologies for local preservation, like leaves and banana leaves and things of that sort. I think thinking about how to commercialize those activities and making sure they're um, safe um, bacteriologically and microbiologically is very important and doable at the local markets, probably less important at the international markets. Um, 
So that's sort of the, the takeaway messages I'm getting from um, these poll questions um, that we have. I don't know if anyone else would like to comment on that. Um, I don't know, Bonnie, if your question is, is unsafe food should be considered, uh, should, should not be considered food? And I agree. I mean, the aspect, if you have a food product that leads to infectious disease, such as diarrheal diseases, um, you're losing the nutrient content that, of anything that it's providing. So the, one of the priorities does have to be the, the, uh, the, the bacteriological and the safety of the food that we can Can I mention one other thing about drying a little bit that, from my experience? Go ahead, Rusty. Yeah, so uh, I've been in several countries where drying sure. herbs and spices and, you know, different products, they use diesel uh, to go to the farm and these, these machines that they, these are major machines that use a lot of diesel in a day and then sometimes they're off-road areas and there's spillage of that diesel. So when we say upscaling drying, we also need to say um, upscale drying technologies as well. So if it's solar, out in the sun, tarp, whatever, uh, it just needs to be handled safely because uh, in the places I've been, I couldn't breathe, just to be honest. Um, so, but the project that I was working with had nothing to do with drying. It was about refrigeration and cold chain, but I have been in some situations where um, the drying technology, the, the equipment was not handled properly. Let's say it that way. Rusty, I think that's a great point. Um, I, I think we need to always, you know, keep in mind um, what harm can be done by different technologies and trying to go to things that are safe both locally and globally. And I think that's where some of the solar yeah. power uh, methods that are coming in that you spoke about um, are really important. And, um, and I'm a big advocate. Um, we have a solar powered drip irrigation system um, in Benin going on now that has nothing to do with the cold chain, but it is de preventing the use of diesel and also the, the fluctuation in the price of diesel. So, you know, once you set something up with a solar system, um, your your investments later on exactly. um, are less because or less or more stable because you don't have to worry about fluctuations in, in the price of petrol. Doug and Rusty, thank you both so much. These are some really vital messages and it's it's so great to see our audience on the webinar today really invested in food safety as a hugely important element of nutrition, of uh, resilience, of you know, a player in the food system. And um, so I just, I'm excited about this conversation that's going on and it seems pretty certain that we'll need to continue the conversation uh, and, and continue to share resources and doing research as a community going forward. Uh, and so I would like to, uh, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up the webinar today. I would like to thank our speakers, Lourdes, Doug and Rusty, and our chat box contributors, Roberta and Russ, for your really excellent contributions to this conversation today. And I would, of course, like to thank the AgriLinks team for your tireless support of this webinar series and all of the behind the scenes work you've been doing to make sure that this is pulled off effectively. But most importantly, I would like to thank our audience for your questions, for the resources you've shared, and for your engagement. You, as always, are the reason that we hold these webinars, and so we're always interested in your feedback uh, on what topics you'd like to discuss, uh, what resources would help you do your job better, and the like. So we are going to move ahead to a few closing polls that we hope that you will uh, quickly give answers to before you take off. And as a reminder, please be on the lookout for an email in your inbox in about a week or a little more than a week uh, with the post-event resources from this webinar. So thank you all. We hope you have a great rest of your day, and we hope that you will go forth and be an advocate for the importance of cold chain management in food safety and protecting against food loss. So thank you all. <laughs>